Hi, welcome to this session on launching a weather balloon. My name is Natasha Wilkerson. I am a co-founder of Vivify STEM, where we create resources to bring engineering to your students. Many of the lessons I develop are based on my experiences as program director of Space Club. This is a national STEM program for elementary and middle school students. And today, I am going to walk you through one of my all-time favorite projects. It's a little intimidating, but it's amazing. Launching a weather balloon to the edge of space. So in this session, I'm going to first show you a video of my Space Club students completing the project, start to finish, so you can get a sense of what it's like, see it in action, have a visual, and then we're going to go into depth on some of the specifics on doing this with your students. I will cover some science of how the weather balloon works and then also experiments that you could do with this project. We'll discuss the materials, the kits, other recommendations, how to manage this project, and then some specifics on launch day and recovering. At the end of the session, we are going to be joined by Claire Meshkat. She is the other co-founder of Vify STEM. And she's actually doing this project right now, this semester, with her students. So we're going to bring her and talk to her about her experience. How did it go? How was launch day? How was recovery? And she can share all the insights on how to do this with your students. But first, let's talk a little bit about why even try to pull this off. Well, I recommend first doing a YouTube search of weather balloon launches because I am pretty amazed at the things that have been sent to the edge of space. There's been everything from paintballs to crickets to marshmallows, action figures, bacon. Uh, there was even a hamburger sent on a weather balloon. And these are actually a great way to get inspired and to introduce this project to your students. And I've linked uh, some of those favorite videos in the handouts that you can download. Okay, so before I overwhelm you too much with all the details, let's talk a little bit about what's involved. What is the weather balloon launch? Well, first, what's gonna be more epic than launching a balloon into near space and then seeing the footage of the earth from above? So basically it involves designing a payload and using a helium balloon to send it up 100,000 feet into the stratosphere. The balloons used are similar to weather balloons that scientists send every day all over the world for weather data. Amateurs can use similar technology to conduct their own balloon launches. And many companies provide very affordable solution for schools and us to host our own balloon launches. So for this project, students work in teams to understand the science behind the balloon launch. They design and build a scientific payload, select the launch site using predictive modeling and weather conditions, launch the balloon, and then analyze the data collected. I feel like this is the ultimate real world project. I mean, just substitute student for scientist. That's exactly how scientists and industry and government labs send experiments into the stratosphere. It's also definitely a multidisciplinary project. I mean, you can modify this to cover a wide range of topics. So let's look at some examples. This is a STEM project. Let's look at each subject. So for science, you can cover relation, uh, concepts related to changes in atmospheric pressure, layers of the atmosphere, the physics of the balloon flight, and process skills related to designing and conducting an experiment. For technology, my students learned how to use a GPS satellite tracker, GoPro camera, temperature and pressure sensors. And then they also had this predictive modeling software to track the recovery of the balloon. For engineering, students will use the design process to build a payload that meets very specific size and weight limitations set by the FAA. And you can also add other criteria. And then for math, my students conducted an analysis of sensor data made calculations to predict the landing site, and then calculated how much helium you needed for the balloon to reach different heights. So more helium, the higher it would go. I mean, come on, this is the ultimate STEM project, right? But this can probably sound a little overwhelming, especially if this is your first time trying to tackle this type of project. And keep in mind though, I mean, you can tailor this to your comfort level. How much time do you have? The skill level of your students. 
One possible project you could focus on just the changes in atmosphere and launch as the balloon goes up through the different layers. You can have a camera, some basic sensors. Or maybe you want to shift focus to an engineering design challenge and you can build a more complex payload or host a bigger experiment. Basically tailor this project to your specific learning objectives. And then you can even create experiments to have to have the students think about different questions like what happens to seeds or bugs or mold or other objects at high altitude. What kind of data can students collect to learn about properties in different layers of the atmosphere? And then I find important is they're using teamwork, communication skills throughout this whole process. And they're going to experience the engineering design process from initial conception to final launch. So they're building up those process skills around investigations and data collection. But what's really important is this project is going to get your kids excited. It's going to build their confidence, their curiosity, get them to think big and have an unforgettable adventure. So now let's take a closer look at this project in action. Sit back and enjoy this production of my Space Club students' adventure in preparing, launching, and recovering a weather balloon. right now space club students from Harlandale ISD are conducting a science experiment by launching high altitude balloons into the stratosphere so it's all happening at BC Environmental in Lavernia and that is we where we are joined by our very own Paul Morellis he's out there and Paul what are the students trying to learn from the experiment Asha Wilkerson she's the STEM director with communities in school and uh, this is going to be a pretty exciting day Oh, we're really excited. So this is all the middle school kids here from Harland ISD. We got about 85 kids. They've been working on this for about a month and a half. And we got a GoPro camera, a GPS tracker. They made 3D printed objects that they're sending. And behind me, that's the helium balloon that we're filling up. A little windy, but it's fun. Right. You know, it's not as easy as you would think to lift one of these off. It took a little bit. The last balloon took a little time, right? Yeah, we had some math calculations we needed to fix. Um, that's why math is important. Um, but you can see the wind behind me just holding that balloon up. We had to do two tries to get it up. So let's hope this one's smooth. This is the second balloon. Where is the first balloon right now? 
So we're actually tracking it live. We have a GPS tracker on it. It's headed to Belmont right now. So okay. as soon as we're done here, we're going to get in a van. We're going to drive about two and a half hours and go get our balloon. All right. You know, this is really exciting. What kind of instruments do you have on this balloon? So on the balloon, we have two GoPro cameras because we want to capture the whole thing. Uh, the kids have a GPS tracker on there to make sure we get it back. Right. They also have a flight computer measuring temperature pressure data the whole way up so we know oh. where we're at and what's happening in the atmosphere. Mm -hmm. And they've also made 3D models. So they have little models that represent their school on the payload. All right, so we're going to find out a lot from these balloons as they go up. Now, I've got a student with me. What, what's your name again? Matthew Sol. Okay, and uh, i got to ask you, how much helium does it take to launch this up to about 60 to 80,000 feet? About 80 cubic inches, uh, cubic feet. 80 cubic feet, that's a lot of healing. Mm -hmm. All right. Six, five, four, three, two, one. All right. Okay, <laughs> slow go, but whoa, there it goes. Weather balloon number two launched and it was a successful launch. And the students at Harlandale Middle School are going to find out all kinds of good information about what's going on in the atmosphere. So what a lot of fun we've out here, had out here in Lavernia. So Stacia, launch was successful. We're going to find out a lot about what's going on in the atmosphere. All right. side of the fence because we think the weather balloon is somewhere back that way. We have found our weather balloon. It is now 5.32 and we've recovered our weather balloon. Oh, I'm like, where's the other rescue team? Is that a beer balloon?
watching our weather balloon adventure. To be honest, each launch is exciting, engaging, but can be frustrating when you're trying to manage the logistics of launching, along with the attention span of middle school students. But I definitely think it's a worthwhile journey for students to experience that real world engineering project with all the design challenges and failures along the way. Okay, so now let's talk about some more specifics of that actual balloon project. Also, my seat is High Altitude Balloon, H-A-B as an acronym, same thing, a weather balloon launch. So we're trying to get this to the upper atmosphere and bring it back. These balloons are basically the same weather balloons as scientists send every day all over the world for weather data. Amateurs have begun to use the same technologies to conduct their own balloon launches, and fortunately, many companies provide affordable solutions for schools to host their balloon launch. So when I introduced the project, I explained to students that all high altitude balloon launch systems have the same basic components. First is the balloon. So when you fill it with helium, the balloon provides the lift for carrying a payload up through our atmosphere. The balloon is gonna expand as atmospheric pressure and temperature drop. And around 80 to 130,000 feet, the balloon pops. So this epic trip to the edge of space takes about two hours. Then we have a parachute. The parachute keeps the payload from falling too fast as it re-enters our Earth's atmosphere. After about 45 minutes on that ride home, it has a gentle landing back on Earth. And then the payload. This has the GPS tracker, the camera, other scientific instruments, payloads that you want to add and send up on this journey. The structure of the payload is typically very lightweight frame or it could be a foam rubber box, depending on what supplier you use. So those are the basic parts. Let's do a little bit of the science. So why does it float? Well, the latex balloon floats once it's filled with the appropriate amount of helium, a gas that's less dense than the air in our atmosphere. In other words, as long as the weight of the helium plus the balloon is lighter than the air displaces, the balloon will float. We just need to have enough helium to provide enough buoyancy force to lift the payload. And then what happens as it moves upward? Well, as the balloon reaches about 100,000 feet, it pops. Why? Because it has less and less pressure the higher it goes, causing the helium of the balloon to expand, stretching it, and then it'll pop. You can introduce ideal gas law here, PV equals NRT, so when the balloon rises in the atmosphere, the surrounding temperature decreases. The pressure decreases, so according to that ideal gas law, the volume must increase to compensate for the change. The volume continues to increase until a balloon, initially six feet in diameter, stretches to 30 feet in diameter and burst. Pretty awesome. Okay, so after this burst, the remaining payload will start to plummet back to Earth. Without anything to break the fall, everything would hit the ground at a terminal velocity of 124 miles per hour. Such a sea speed would destroy anything in the payload, so you've got to have that parachute to slow the descent. And it has to be attached in a way that the flight train keeps the parachute shut during launch, but when the balloon bursts, it opens up as the air rushes and opens up the parachute, giving us that soft landing. The payload now can travel quite a distance, so we also gotta have that tracking device to know where it ends up landing. Now you might be wondering, is this even legal? Yes. So you can uh, follow the guidance of the Federal Aviation Administration, FAA, and there's some important rules you've gotta note. Payloads should not exceed the three ounce per square inch of package weight to size ratio. The maximum weight for any payload package is six pounds. The total weight of all the payloads, the weight of the balloon, uh, is not included here, should not exceed 12 pounds. The rope or cable used should not require more than 50 pounds of force to separate the payload packages from the balloon. The launch should not create any hazard to any people or property. And for safety reasons, no one should use high altitude balloons to drop objects such as gliders and projectiles. So to complete this project, my students would meet weekly for an hour starting six weeks prior to the launch. Over the six weeks, I first introduced weather balloons with some of those exciting videos I mentioned, and then explained the science of how weather balloons work. 
I did this through class presentations, demos, and then having students explore websites, watch videos to explore those topics. We then divided the project into specifics of what was the purpose of our launch? What materials are we gonna to need to use? Where and when would we launch? And how are we gonna get it all done? So then, once we knew those basics, I divided students into teams to take ownership of this project. I try to provide mentors to support those, student, those students. Now, if you don't have access to mentors, perhaps finding a local STEM professional with some experience with weather balloons, they can give a brief presentation on how you can bring this real world project um, into the classroom. So for teams, I assign students to five teams with a project manager of each. First, we're payload specialists. They're responsible for the design and build of the payload to keep equipment safe during launch and landing. Second, mission control to manage logistics for a successful launch and recovery. Third, we're mission specialists who are responsible for the design and conducting a science experiment during flight, including capturing the flight data. Four, we're mission specialists that are responsible to capture and edit GoPro footage from the launch and to document the project. And five was the recovery team, this important job to track and retrieve that payload. So for each team, I had specific tasking each week with milestones to check in and make sure they were making progress. I also had team leaders make presentations to the entire class to give everyone informed and have the opportunity to provide input. So for example, the mission specialist team, they would present ideas on the science experiment to the class and we would do a poll. So to help them come up with a science experiment, we discussed as a class, what is the balloon gonna experience? It's gonna have lower pressure, really cold temperatures, increased radiation on its journey to the stratosphere. So what's an experiment we can design and how that those conditions would affect something we would send on the payload. We could have sensors, maybe they would capture temperature, carbon dioxide, solar radiation, humidity, and so on. Okay, so now you kind of have a sense of those basics. Let's talk about how to actually pull this off, what materials you're gonna to need to do this project. So in Space Club, we use the Eagle Pro Weather Balloon Kit sold by High Altitude Science, about $750. What's included is an Eagle Flight Computer. This has the ability to record pressure, temperature, altitude, and GPS. It worked great, it's just not weatherproof. So if you land in water, you're gonna lose probably your data. It has a payload frame, which is basically a light and strong wooden frame to attach all that hardware. This is really easy to build, put together, and it always lands upright, which is a must for that tracker. So I really, really recommend this frame, especially for your first launch. The frame also includes a camera mount, so you can add that GoPro camera or other camera, not included in the kit. So you've gotta have some kind of camera to capture this whole adventure. It does come with a balloon, this latex balloon. I recommend starting with the smaller size. It's a little easier to manage launch day. And it includes a nozzle, uh, inflation nozzle and gas regulator. Very easy to use. You'll just have to purchase some helium. Parachute and rope is provided that attaches to the payload in the balloon. Then you have a tracker, a satellite tracker that's provided to help you with recovery. Now you've got to pay this annual fee. It's $150 of a subscription to use the tracker. I also, on one of my launches, bought a second one for a backup solution. Finally, there's this flight manual that gives you all the details on how to build the kit, launch, recovery. Gotta say, I did miss a lot of critical information that I had to go search elsewhere. But good news, you're watching this video, check out the handout, we've got all the missing pieces for you. Now, you notice I mentioned things that are not included in the kit. All together, I've put this whole list of materials in the handout, things like helium, SD cards, other things that we found really useful. In total, for your budget, I would plan between fifteen to seventeen hundred for that budget. Okay, now that you have materials, let's talk about the site. Here's what's important to keep in mind. You gotta be away from a major airport. Balloons should not be flying over a major city. You wanna avoid water, lakes, rivers, and so on. And then you have to be somewhere with an open wide space for it to launch and not get stuck on anything. 
So I've always been in a very remote place um, in San Antonio, so we'd go far south San Antonio and made sure that wherever it was going to land, it was not going over the city. And that's where you have this predictive uh, model that tells you about where it will go. And this can land up to 100 miles away, so it's kind of crazy looking to see where you're going to track it. And I have linked in the handout some of the tools you can use to figure out that trajectory. And the students did this as part of the project, looking at depending on the weather conditions, where were the potential landing spots. You can do this the weeks leading up to the launch, but you're really not going to have the most accurate data because of the weather, biggest part, about a day before, which I know that's kind of scary, but that's how it goes. Now for tracking, you have that GPS tracker. That's going to track your payload the entire flight. Now, it, it, whenever you use it, it pings you every 10 minutes. I found this to be really the most reliable way to use the tracker unless you have a ham radio license. Spot Trace has its own satellite network so it can connect directly to the tracker. You can look at it on the website, but it only tracks the 60,000 feet. So at any point that it goes up beyond the 60,000 feet, you're not going to know where it is. Once it goes back down to 60,000, under 60,000, then it'll show back up on the website. Okay, so now let's talk about some tips here to maximize your chances of success on that recovery. I sometimes, I would recommend two trackers. You can also use an APRS, APRS radio, if you have a ham radio license. Um, write your contact information on the payload in case someone finds it. Make it colorful, easy to spot, reflective materials. You can even add an audio beacon to help with recovery. It's basically something that just beep, beep, beep. But that can be kind of scary for someone who finds it if they have no idea what it is, but it really helps with recovery. Now, you're probably overwhelmed right now, and it was a lot of information, but this will become clear as you read the handout, project guide, and then just come back to this video if you want to have a refresher. But what I would like to do is bring Claire. So she just completed this weather balloon project with her students for the first time. Let's talk to her and get her adventure of launching her first weather balloon. Hello, Claire. How are you doing? I'm doing great. Well, I am excited to talk about this epic adventure that you just had, right? You just finished this weather balloon project. How did it go? Right. So a few days ago, we finally launched this weather balloon that we've been preparing for with my students for the last two months, and then we're able to successfully recover it. There's some few bumps in the road on the way to recovery, but as expected, and so many things gained from both failure and throughout this process of launching this weather. Tell everybody your position and who were the students involved with this project? So I am a kindergarten through sixth grade STEM teacher, and I did this project with 17 fifth and sixth graders. So I meet with them twice a week, for 45 minutes a piece, and we did this all during school class time. And how did you manage this project and over how many weeks? We did this over about eight weeks, and I broke up the students into teams like you previously talked about. And then I had liaisons in each team where they had to communicate to the other teams what they were doing. We didn't have much time to have them present what they were finding. So we just had them being in constant communication with the other teams to make sure that everything was covered. I was learning through it too. This is my first time to launch a weather balloon. So I really didn't know how to guide them. So we were kind of learning together, which was really exciting. And they asked really great questions. So that was really helpful as we, we finally accomplished this project. And I think you also brought in some guest speakers, right? To help you talk about that. Yeah. That's exactly right. So I really wanted to have mentors to help my students, but it was really hard to do that and having people that could be there when I had classes. So what did I ended up, what I ended up doing was having students be able to Zoom, do Zoom sessions with some experts. So first thing we did is we actually reached out to a local news station and talked to them about what we were doing and how we thought it could fit in with maybe their goals in talking and educating kids about weather. And so they actually sponsored part of our project, which was amazing. And then 
the meteorologist, the chief meteorologist was able to do a Zoom session with our students and talk to them about how weather balloons are used every day. I mean, I thought, you know, even as an aerospace engineer myself, I thought, oh, well, I'm sure we use satellites and all sorts of complicated equipment to figure out what our weather forecasts are. But no, we use weather balloons, just like what we just sent up with our students. 900 weather balloons are sent up around the world every day, twice a day. Wow. And that is the only way that we know what's going to happen in our weather. That's crazy. Yeah, that's crazy. So, it was really cool to have a meteorologist talk through this with my students as they were preparing. So they had more of an idea of the big picture of this project. We also brought in a, a man who works in the Air Force and he uses weather data to be able to prep his pilots so that they're able to accomplish their missions too. So I was trying to bring in a wide range of real world applications to why this project is so important and how it is actually used by real scientists today. That's awesome. So as you're organizing the project, um, and, and I talked about this in the video, there's so many different directions you can go. You can focus on the engineering side with the payload, the, the learning outcomes could be on the science experiment. How did you, or what were your learning outcomes? What was your focus since this was your first time? Right. It was hard to figure out what I should focus on for this first time. I wanted to do all the things. So we did, we're able to touch on all the aspects of STEM with the science experiment, with the engineering of building things and bringing in the technology with the trackers. And so I, I think you can do so much with this, but you do kind of have to narrow it down. And big picture, I wanted my students to see how they can accomplish great things that are used in the real world, like I just talked about. Um, and then bringing in the community and our whole school to get them involved. And so I did that with the science experiment. So I had a lot of science focus on this project. We, I had my students research the way that temperature and pressure affects different things like food, batteries, different gases. And so they were able to like read through some information that I gave them and say, I propose a question say, well, what do you think based on what you just learned, how uh, sending up a bug in the weather balloon would be affected or how would bubble wrap uh, react when you send that up on the weather balloon and then they narrowed down to three different ideas that they had and then proposed that to the school and the school voted on which science experiment to send up and they ultimately chose a raw chicken egg nice. which is pretty interesting yeah so then i was able to have them use the engineering design process to come up with a way up with a way to attach the raw chicken egg safely to the payload in a way that we could still see what happens with the GoPro camera that was on board as well. What was your experience using this uh, high altitude science uh, kit? Because I know it comes with a frame and it has a lot of the components. What was your experience with that? That was super useful. I would highly recommend starting with a kit for your yeah. first time. I know that you've built your own payloads before and that seems Just really once, overwhelming. And I don't know if I would do it again. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah, the high altitude science is their kit was everything that we needed and they really give you a good guideline of where things go. It's already pre-drilled holes, so it's easy for the students to figure out, okay, this attaches here, this has space for this, and it's really lightweight. So it really takes a lot of the guesswork, um, especially if it's your first time in figuring out what to do. Are there any lessons learned um, on just the setup? So before we get to launch day, you know, organizing this project, getting ready for it, what, anything you would do differently, any advice you have? I would definitely try to be more redundant with mm -hmm. the different ways of tracking and collecting data. We did have end up going with two different trackers on ours. So we had the spot trace, which is the GPS tracker. And uh, that was really useful because that's the only tracker that ended up working when, when we had launched the payload. We also had an APRS transmitter, which is what the a ham radio license is needed to launch. And that's, I heard, is the most reliable because yeah. it's also sending you weather data, like in the moment, like altitude and, and pressure temperature readings and things like that. So it's also not just a redundancy in tracking, but also a redundancy in flight data. Mm -hmm. um, but unfortunately, our battery popped out at some point of the 
of the flight or of the launch. And so we did, weren't able to use that tracker. So I'm grateful that we had redundancy in having the spot trace. The one thing that we didn't have redundancy on was the GoPro camera. So next time I would love to send up multiple cameras just in case one doesn't work or we had the battery ran out after the balloon pop so we didn't get to see the video of the descent and I'd really love the kids to be able to see that as well as a different angle from the payload like maybe pointing up to see the balloon itself. Nice. Okay so I really want to get to launch day because when I've done this in the past, it's just been me and the students, you know, we had some cameras, we did this launch, but you went next level <laughs> and you just had this epic event. Um, can you talk about first the build up to this? Because it actually got canceled the first time. And then how did it go? Like, tell me about this crazy, epic adventure. <laughs> yeah. So I think one of the most, uh, nerve wracking <laughs> to put it lightly parts of this project is that you can't control the weather <laughs> and that's a lot of what you're learning is about weather and so we actually had to cancel it twice while we were trying to launch this balloon we ended up moving it twice the launch day but i knew that i wanted to have our location that we ended up choosing for several reasons we chose to launch at an airport and i know in the guidelines you're not supposed to be anywhere near a major airport. So we chose one, I live in a rural part of North Texas. We chose a airport that is not controlled. And so it's a really not in a congested area or anything like that. There's not a lot of aircraft that are flying all the time. But I chose that location for several reasons. One, I am an aviation enthusiast. I'm a student pilot, my husband's a pilot, and we spend a lot of time at the airport. But I wanted the aircraft to be safe. I didn't want to pose any hazards to airplanes that might be flying in the area. So I thought, well, what a better way to do that than be the most visible by launching at the airport itself. Another reason why that is really helpful is that if you're launching at an airport, that's safe for airplanes to fly. So there's no other things that could harm the weather balloon as well. So there wasn't any power lines or tall towers or any obstructions that could harm our weather balloon. So it was a perfect location. Another thing I wanted to do was bring more awareness to aviation in general. We are flying a weather balloon, so I want to talk about flight. So I contacted the airport manager and we arranged to have several different airplanes and aircraft to be there at the event to show the kids as we're prepping and getting ready for launch. There's a lot of downtime at the very beginning. And I wanted families to be able to come out and watch the weather balloon, but also to experience what you could do with aviation and weather, like who uses that data? A lot of airplanes, you have to, to know how to fly. So we had gyrocopters, helicopters, we had a agricultural crop duster there. We had a um, World War II era biplane that was open cockpit that was giving rides to people. So it was, it was incredible. And uh, I also kind of had that as like an insurance too, just in case everything went badly with the weather balloon that, Hey, you still came out and had fun so and learned some things, but it, it was, it was amazing. We also had a bake sale for our school during the event. Cause I thought if people get hungry, they can buy from the bake sale and also help raise money for more awesome projects like this for our school. Um, one thing I remember from launch day that's the most overwhelming is you have this checklist that is so long and detailed. And in the moment, you're overwhelmed because not only are you thinking about the weather balloon launch, but you're dealing with all the kids and what are they doing? And then the people watching you and then you're getting interviewed for live TV, right? You had the <laughs> weather channel. <laughs> so um, I've had things go wrong because of that chaos. Um, we, we released a balloon and didn't go anywhere because we didn't have enough helium. Um, what went wrong at your launch? So actually the same thing that happened to you happened to me too. You so. didn't learn from me. <laughs> no. So what do, we don't know what happened. I guess we're thinking that since we both did it wrong, I feel like then it can't be our fault. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to go with that. So yes, there is a, part of this project where you have to calculate how much helium goes into the balloon based on the weight of your payload and how fast you want it to ascend. 
So we did all the calculations and we used the little gauge that comes with the high altitude science kit and it just didn't work. We did the whole countdown, everybody was watching and we released it and it just started dragging the payload and like tumbling and everything on the ground. And I was chasing after it because I was like, don't let the balloon hit the ground, it'll pop. Um, so yeah, I mean, in, embarrassing, your nerves are like crazy and like, what are we gonna do? But thankfully we had a big helium tank and just added a bunch more helium. Uh, it was really windy that day too. So I'm thinking we had to overcome that wind as well to to get it to go up. So I think what happened, we had a really windy day too. When you're pulling on the gauge, the wind is picking up the balloon. And so you're not getting an accurate measurement, right? But I don't That's know how true. to overcome that. Right. So we inflated the balloon inside the first time. So oh, we didn't did. have that problem. So I don't have that excuse. But oh. the second time I was trying to gauge it and it was like, you know, doing this. I'm like, yeah, I have no idea how much balloon, <laughs> uh, how much helium is in this balloon. Um, so there is another way that they recommend inflating the balloon using water in a two liter bottle. So I think I'll try that next time and do more research on on how to how to accurately gauge how much helium is in your in your balloon right so but, i've done both and the two liter bottle was the first couple launches and it never failed me and i was like i don't need this i'll just use this gauge and it failed the one time i didn't have the two liter bottle so maybe just we should go back to the old school method <laughs> there's a lot of things that you have to consider to protect the payload as it's going up one is temperature because it's going to get real cold so that was something that we also had a failure on is our gopro camera uh, worked really well all the way up until the balloon popped and then we have no footage after that and I think it's because the battery ran out because it was so cold up there so I think I'll try to um, do a way to warm keep the GoPro camera warm next time the other thing that we had to consider was that a couple of times I ran the calculations to predict where it might land and it would land in a lake so we figured out how to make the payload float by adding like the insulating tubing that you can find for pipes. We added a bunch of those to the frame, kind of like pool noodles, yeah. to make sure that it would float in case it landed in water. Um, and then also with the science experiment, how to protect it from all the different things that could go wrong. And so um, it actually really was helpful when we failed on the ground too. So. And so in the kit, what did you add that didn't already come? So you said those pool noodle things to help it float. Was there anything else you needed to buy that was extra? Yes. So it doesn't come with the GoPro camera. So we bought one of those. And in the guide that we have, we suggest which one to get. Because I think the newer GoPro cameras don't help as much with temperature as the older ones. So there's mm -hmm. a, a version that we would recommend. Um, at this point. And then the, it doesn't come with the APRS transmitter. So we added that. And then a radar reflector. I thought that was really important. That's not required for safety from the FAA, but it's really helpful for air traffic control to be able to see your balloon on their radar. Um, so we added, added that as well. I would also recommend buying extras of the balloon and plenty of extra helium uh, in case what happens to you is what happened to us. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. So you've launched the balloon the second time, right? It's successfully released. What happened next? So, you know, all you can do at that point is just hope that your trackers work. And one of them automatically didn't. And so we think that when we had that tumble, the battery got loose enough to where it fell out. My students, I mean, we had the, all these checklists, right? I had three students with all the same checklists, so they were triple checking everything um, because I know that I couldn't because I was like talking on live TV for the Weather Channel. Right. Right. So uh, everything went well uh, in releasing it. So we know that probably the battery just fell out from the APRS transmitter, but the spot trace tracker started working. So then some the recovery team and I got in my car and we just started following wherever that tracker was showing it was because we wanted to be there on site whenever it landed so that we could make sure we recover it. Nobody else does because I mean, it's got a GoPro on it. We we're hoping that nobody would want to take it. So we drove for about three hours. 
the uh, we launched about an hour later than we had planned. So the weather had changed, the winds had changed. So it went in a different direction and farther than we had anticipated. So we ended up in um, a really congested city in North Texas. We ended up in Fort Worth. <laughs> so uh, we were driving into the night and Wait, we got- so where, to, How far off was it from where you planned or you expected it to go? Oh gosh, it went, I mean, an hour and a half longer of a drive wow. than we expected it to go. Yes, because the winds had picked yeah. up so much. And you had more helium also than you have. Well, you don't know, but you don't know. I don't know. Yeah, that's that's right. I mean, I'm I'm very much a planner and I calculate things and then all bets were off once we had to figure out how to how to launch it the second time. So, yeah, we we weren't really sure. But thankfully, the tracker was super accurate and we got to where it showed that it was and we could not find it. But at that point, it was really late at night. It was dark. There's really tall trees in the area and we just couldn't see. So we ended up pretty, being pretty defeated and we drove all the way back to our home. But the next day I was just going to take a screenshot of where the tracker said it was and make flyers to send out to the area of like, please return this. Uh, it's a science project for these right. schools. But another thing that I also added on the payload was a picture of my students and Perfect. my phone number saying that this is a, a class project. Look at these sweet faces. Please return this if you find it. And so I was hopeful that maybe somebody would pick it up, but I was making these flyers and I noticed when I was going to take a screenshot of the tracker that it had moved. So ended up moving to a neighborhood where we were able to find people that lived in that area that went and searched for it and they found it stuck in a tree. So, so uh, then they had the fire department come out and retrieve it out of the tree. It ended up being more exciting and more of an adventure than we'd anticipated. And it, I mean, it's just amazing what this will do for your students. Yeah, I was so nervous whenever you had texted me that night, like, how accurate is the tracker? And I was like, oh, no, they can't find it. And then you sent me like a depressing message that morning. And I, I remember thinking it's not over until it's over, like, because I've been through this almost every launch, something crazy happens. And I think that's really important for teachers that are planners and that want to control things that you cannot control this. It's so it's going to be a crazy adventure. And if everything goes perfectly, it's not, you might not even get your data back, right? Like it could land in a lake and sink to the bottom. Someone could steal it. Like you just can't control that end result. Um, but how awesome, like how it, you know, came back. Okay. So then you got it, came back to you. And then what did you see? So, you know, like you said, you don't even know if you get it back, if it collected any data, if your GoPro right. camera even works, you know, I trusted the kids to turn it on. So maybe they didn't even turn it on. Right. Uh, and then just the footage that we got because everything worked and it's just incredible. You see these videos like we're sharing on this on this video of just the I mean, the curvature of the earth. You could you could see how into space like it's it's really incredible what you can do with just this seemingly small student project and like you're talking about, there's so much that's out of your control. And we always talk about modeling things to our students. How often do we model our own failures to our students? And this is just an amazing opportunity to show them, hey, just like in school, in any class, you don't know what the outcomes are gonna be. You're probably nervous when you're taking a test or a project, you don't have control and you think that the teachers do, but on this one, nobody does and so you have to learn through that and you're able to show them like this is what we're preparing for this is what we can control anything that we get back from this is extra and it's going to be incredible experience either way if we don't get anything back or if we do there's learning objectives that are accomplished both ways yeah i, I absolutely love that perspective because i'm thinking when we have our kids do an engineering challenge or a science experiment they're doing it and we're just watching right and we're we're usually grading them and judging them right but this you are in it with them on launch day you are freaking out just like they are and you're like is it on is the camera on is it and they they watch you and you have to be very aware of that and you're like okay keep it together you know show how you're gonna like persevere <laughs> through this but they see you as like a real person 
person and that you experience failure and how you kind of hold it together and how you stay calm and okay, didn't work guys, let's do it again. Like the launch got canceled, that's okay. We didn't get our payload, that's okay. We had an amazing adventure. Like you can frame that differently every time you experience a failure. Um, so what was in the end, I know you just presented this to your school. Uh, what was kind of the conclusion? How did the students think about this whole project? They, because they all had roles in this project and giving them jobs was so important, which I had them apply for and like a Ooh. real job. They had to share like what experience would qualify them for this job. And so some kids were like, well, I, I've made several videos, so I'd be really good to be on the media specialist team. Or um, one, one student said, well, my grandfather worked in mission control at NASA during the Apollo program. So I would really love to be on mission control. I was like, Okay. <laughs> yes. Um, and so because they had such ownership, they were like, oh, we did it. Like, look at what we did. Look at. And so there's this whole sense of accomplishment, not even with just the students that were part of it, but the whole school. They all voted on the science experiment. Um, even at the event, I had a big chalkboard and said, what do you think will happen to this raw chicken egg? Will it freeze or will it explode? And I had them mark and vote on what they'd want to do. So it was like this sense of accomplishment for our whole community almost of getting to watch this journey and experience and be a part of it. That's amazing. I love that you had the engagement at the event where they got to vote. That's, that's really cool. I had done um, a Twitter hashtag. And so I would keep everybody updated through Twitter because all the parents were like, where is it? Where are we going? So I think that's a great way to get the community, the parents, the school involved. Okay, so my final question, I you've been through a lot of ups and downs over this year going through this project. Would you recommend it and would you do it again? That's a great question. So it was actually after that first night when we could not find the payload and I came home and I was just really you know, disappointed and really kind of think like, how am I gonna recover this? And I'd spent several, weeks just like stressing over all the little details and things and I was told my husband I was like maybe this is like every three years right. thing um I don't know if I can handle this but just seeing how it all came together and looking back over the last two months I mean it was just so incredible that I don't think there's any other project we could do that would give the students so much experience and knowledge gained and understanding and growth mindset that this is going to definitely be an every year thing for me. And I would highly recommend any teacher to take this on for their students, because no matter what happens, it's worth it. And I would say whether you're elementary, middle, high school, this can college, there's high altitude balloon clubs in college. Like it's really all ages and you can adapt it and modify it for any of your students. Um, so I hope that you guys learned something from this video talking with Claire. Thank you so much uh, for joining me and you can, guys can learn more about our adventures. I know you're going to be posting more photos and videos on our website, uh, which is vivifystem.com. And we hope to connect with everybody soon. Thank you. Thank you.